Já estamos ao vivo. Ok, so, um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Zoom na Cartografia. Is the broadcast ok? Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Ok, um, so, first of all, we have had a problem with the broadcasting from Zoom to YouTube, so we had to emigrate to another YouTube address, and we apologize for this inconvenience. Um, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure for the linguistics community in Brazil to be launching this series of colloquia called Zoom na Cartografia, which is Portuguese for cartography, Zoom in. I am Gabriel Walter Fuchsberger, an undergraduate student from the Federal University of Santa Catarina, UFSC, where I am a member of the NEC, the Center for Grammatical Studies, and Professor Sandra Quaresimin is my advisor. Uh, I would like to say to Professor, uh, to Professor Achilles Tescarineto and Professor Sandra Quaresemin, the organizers, that I am very honored to be invited to do this introduction to the brilliant guest of this conference. We are pleased to be making these meetings happen live. After this stream is over, a recording will be available for viewing on YouTube right here on this channel. So thank you very much for being here with us. Our guest today is Professor Luigi Rizzi, who is a full professor of linguistics at the University of Siena and honorary professor at College de France. Of course, Professor Luigi Rizzi needs no introduction. He will have an hour to give his conference, which is entitled Cartographic Structures and the Growth of Trees in Language Development. After that, we'll have some time for discussion. So please, if you have any questions, uh, we are preparing uh, an address for you to send us, and then we will uh, address them to Professor Luigi Rizzi. And please also leave your full name, country, and institution. And now, Professor Rizzi, welcome to Zoom na Cartografia. The floor is yours. Please begin. Okay, thank you very much. Much, Gabriel, for your introduction. Let me thank the organizers, uh, Achilles and Sandra. I'm very pleased to be uh, with you for uh, this opportunity. Uh, in uh, this talk, I'd like to um, report on uh, a, a research, a joint research that I've pursued with Adriana Belletti and Nama Friedman over the last couple of years. Um, I will cover, by and large, the content uh, which should have been the content of uh, my talk at the International Workshop on Syntactic Cartography about a month ago. But as some of you uh, noticed, uh, there were major, major technical problems which made that presentation extremely difficult. So I hope that things will work out fine uh, today. OK, so let me start by um, going through some uh, of the basic goals of cartographic work. Um, the, the first goal is descriptive. So what cartography tries to do is to offer detailed descriptions of the fine structures of phrases and clauses across languages, right? So and then we want to observe what the uh, invariant properties are and what uh, the range of variations uh, uh, is. But this is largely a vast descriptive project. Now, the term description uh, quite often doesn't get a very good press in formal linguistics, right? Uh, description is considered a kind of secondary uh, thing, secondary activity, but in fact, it's not correct. A good description is absolutely essential for theoretical work. This is true not only in linguistics, but in science in general, right? Just think, for instance, of the detailed description of planetary motions that Tycho Brahe provided. That was absolutely essential to permit Kepler to find out the laws ruling uh, planetary motions. And in the history of science, we have plenty of examples of that sort. Now, uh, in the case of languages, uh, the issue of description is particularly acute and serious because uh, 
just think of the fact that um, of the thousands and thousands of languages that are spoken nowadays, only a very tiny fraction has been described in a satisfactory way. So we want to contribute to this uh, descriptive endeavor by focusing specifically on uh, structures, essentially. Uh, and um, um, I, I think one, uh, one can add that, uh, uh, you know, th this kind of contribution is absolutely, absolutely essential for theoretical work. And this is in fact the second point, the second goal. Um, we want to be able to trace back fundamental aspects of our descriptions, the generalizations that we observe, for instance, the properties that we observe, by establishing deductive connections, connecting these observations to fundamental principles of universal grammar, fundamental principle, principles of the human language faculty. So there is a constant interaction between the theory and description. Uh, which uh, characterizes uh, this line of uh, research. I would say generative grammar in general, but uh, cartographic work in particular with specific reference to the characteristic properties of structures. And then there are some goals that are more specific of uh, uh, the characterization of language. One is to contribute to the program of syntacticization of morphology program that really started with Chomsky's syntactic structures. If you remember his analysis of verbal affixation in English, right? that, that really was the beginning of the program that says fundamentally morphology is syntax. Morphology is made of the stuff that syntax is made of. Fundamentally, the same ingredients are involved um, a, a list of uh, atoms, a list of elements, uh, and merge fundamentally. That, that's what determines both complex words and phrases. Uh, and there are, of course, a number of uh, research directions that are somehow connected to cartography, like uh, Michel Stark's nanosyntax, uh, that try to pursue this kind of uh, uh, program. And then another goal uh, is to integrate adverbial positions in the structure of the clause and adjectival positions in nominal structures. So just think of uh, uh, the work initiated by Guglielmo Cinque and continued by many of us, many of you guys, uh, to do that. Okay, so the, that, that's a very important goal. And a fifth goal is to integrate in the structure of the clause certain articulations linked to the organization of discourse. So this has sometimes been defined as the syntactic syntacticization or partial syntacticization uh, of scope discourse semantics. So we want to characterize syntactic properties of articulations like topic comment, focus presupposition, thus connecting syntax and syntactic structures to discourse structure. And then of course, sixth goal, which is uh, in fact a cover term for many different things, we want to um, connect cartographic research with various domains in the study of languages as a cognitive capacity. First of all, language acquisition. This will be the topic of today's talk, but also second language acquisition language teaching, uh, the training of teachers. This is something that is pursued in uh, important work in uh, Brazil with Achilles and uh, his team. The study of language pathologies, computational linguistics. Just think of work like uh, Cristiano Casey, for instance, uh, or uh, Giuseppe Samo and uh, uh, Paola Merlo. Okay, so these are kind of very general and certainly non-exhaustive characterization of what we are trying to do. Now, specifically focusing on acquisition, I think that um, cartography and acquisition studies connect in at least two ways. On the one hand, there is some issue related to cartography and the logical problem of language acquisition. So how can complex cartographic structures that we describe be acquired by the child in principle. 
Now, there is a lot of critical literature on the cartographic enterprise, as uh, you probably know, and uh, uh, part of the critiques uh, relate to this point. Uh, and it is observed in this literature that there is a tension between concerns of learnability and concerns of evolvability, right? So uh, the argument that is made is that if cartographic structures are innate, of course, the learnability problem is trivially solved. But uh, you know, this would require the assumption of a very rich and structured universal grammar, which is against the spirit of the time. Uh, and, and in fact, you may wonder uh, you know, if uh, cartographic structures were axioms in universal grammar, uh, of course, you, you may wonder why the human language faculty evolved in such a way that it contains uh, such extremely complicated macromolecules as primitive properties. So this is taken uh, as a problem for cartographic studies in uh, uh, much uh, critical uh, literature. Now, is there any way out of this conundrum? Yes, I think the, what we should do is to connect description and explanation. And we should try to deduce properties of the functional sequences from plausible UG principles. So not just assume that, you, uh, that uh, cartographic sequences are given by universal grammar, but rather that they have properties that can be deduced from more plausible UB, UG principles. This is a topic that I have developed in a number of uh, recent papers. And I will not look at that uh, today. I will rather focus on the second point, which is uh, how does cartography relate to language development? Um, how do things happen concretely in the time course of language acquisition? So let's see what uh, we can say about that. So, um, again, there are two types of interaction from both uh, directions, I would say. Um, on the one hand, um, you know, uh, cartography has something to offer to the study of acquisition. So we want to know what the steps are in the acquisition of these complex uh, structures. And then we should ask the question if functional hierarchies offer any guidance for the study of development and are such structures all present at once as soon as we can test children's linguistic abilities or are they acquired piece after piece? And if this is the case, what is the size of each piece? And secondly, acquisition studies have something to offer to cartography in the sense that uh, acquisition studies may offer new types of evidence for choosing between alternative cartographic hypotheses. And we will see uh, in uh, today's discussion some examples of this sort. So both cartography and uh, acquisition and development studies has something, have something to offer to the other discipline, to the other line of research. Okay, the uh, logic that we have proposed in this paper that uh, just appeared in uh, Glossa is called the growing trees logic. And the idea is that trees are acquired bottom up with lower zones acquired earlier and higher zones uh, growing on top of lower zones. And uh, the acquisition of a zone defines a developmental stage. Um, so, for instance, uh, we uh, predict uh, with this logic that we'll find a group of children in stage one uh, having mastered zone A, abstract zone A of the syntactic tree, and then another group, the second group, having mastered the A and the zone B, dropping on top of uh, uh, A. And then another third group with zone C dropping on top of uh, uh, B, but we do not expect to find a group of children uh, who master B but not uh, A, for instance, or C but not A and B. And we do not expect to find situations like three prime, uh, a group of children who master A and C but not the connecting zone uh, B. Okay, so this. Uh, 
absence of internal gaps is uh, uh, very similar, uh, in fact, reminiscent logic of truncation uh, as developed in the 1990s and then revamped uh, in uh, recent work and also other types of work like uh, Friedman and Brzezinski's uh, work um, on uh, tree pruning in uh, certain types of uh, uh, language uh, pathology. And I will come back to this point uh, uh, at the end of the talk. Okay, so one tool that turned out to be extremely useful to do this kind of uh, work uh, is uh, uh, the Dogatman scales, uh, a time-honored device that was rediscovered by Nalma Friedman, who showed the relevance of this device to express properties uh, uh, between which uh, certain implicational relations hold. Okay, so the uh, abstract situation can be characterized by this diagram that we have here. Suppose that here, each child corresponds to one line. Then we have given three abstract properties, A, B, and C. We have a group of children who has none of the properties. Then we have some children who have property A, but not B and C. Then a group of children who have property A and B, but not C. And then a group of children who have A, B, and C, okay? But no child who has, let's say, B without also having A. So this is a very effective way of expressing implication relations here. Clearly, having B implies having A, and having C implies having B and A. Uh, now, the actual uh, Deathman scales that uh, we'll use uh, are a bit less neat than uh, uh, the abstract example, but we can see a very clear pattern, as we'll see in a moment. Now, we need some cartography. We need some uh, assumptions about the backbone of the left peripheral map. And we need at least the assumptions that are indicated here, assumptions that are empirically justified, of course. So we need uh, the hypothesis that uh, the left periphery is uh, delimited by uh, force and finiteness, force expressing a closal type. Then we have this uh, projection in the upper part of the left periphery int, uh, which is relevant for today's discussion in that it hosts in its specifier WH element Y and other reason WH elements, which have a behavior that is very different, different from other types of WH elements. Then we have a topic position. This is what I would call the core topic position. That is to say, if a language has a topic position, it would be in this position, the upper part of the left periphery, uh, higher than focus. We know that in uh, there is a lot of variation on this in many languages, including the Romance languages. There is a proliferation of topic positions, also with lower topic positions. But today I'll be concentrating on this core topic position found in the upper part of the left periphery. Then we have the lower part of the left periphery with the focus uh, projection, which I will use for today's discussion only as uh, the landing site of WH movement, right? Regular WH movement tar targets the focus position. That's why it's called Q slash uh, focus uh, in uh, this uh, representation. And then we have mod, which is uh, the left peripheral head that can host uh, preposed adverbials in structures like uh, for instance, suddenly John left the room, suddenly is highlighted by being moved to the left periphery, and he targets a special position. It's not a proper topic or a proper focus, but there is a dedicated position called uh, mod uh, as modifier in uh, the literature to indicate this kind of dedicated position to propose that variables. So that's the structure I need. So let's uh, consider Either some empirical evidence for the different points. The fact that uh, the core topic position is higher than the focus position is shown by many, many languages. Let me just uh, give four illustrations of that. African languages like Gumbe show that uh, you know, morphologically marked topics necessarily precede and are higher than uh, morphologically marked foci. 
Same thing in uh, an Austronesian language like Maori, for instance, except that the markers of topic and focus precede the elements rather than following it as in Gumbe, but the order is the same, topic higher than focus. Then we have the same order in languages that do not morphologically mark topic and focus, like Hungarian, for instance, but that's the only possible order as illustrated in this example. And then also in uh, uh, other in, in Indo-European languages, in Romance languages, also in Italian, in spite of the proliferation of topic positions, there are certain constructions that show us uh, that topic must necessarily be higher than focus given the properties of the, these particular constructions. For instance, if we have, uh, if we combine a question with a topic, the only possible order, as in this Italian sentence, uh, is uh, a topic followed by the WH element illustrating the focus position. So, questo libro, a chi lo darai, or something like that. So, is the only possible order in this configuration. Okay, second point. Um, relative pronouns occupy a higher position in the left periphery than uh, interrogative pronouns. This was uh, one of the initial observations of cartographic work on the left periphery. And this is shown by a typical transitivity argument. Relative pronouns like a cui in this Italian example necessarily precede the topic. This is the only possible order, whereas uh, uh, WH pronouns, as in uh, uh, interrogative pronouns, as in injured questions, necessarily follow the uh, topic, uh, which uh, gives rise to the order relative element, uh, uh, topic, uh, interrogative element. So the position that is occupied by relative elements uh, is uh, higher than the topic position, in fact, than all topic positions, uh, whereas uh, the WH movement targets uh, lower position, as illustrated by these examples. As I said, uh, ordinary WH elements target the focus position, which explains why uh, WH and focus are incompatible uh, in Italian, for instance. You cannot have both elements, uh, as in uh, this kind of example. On the other hand, uh, an element like Y, the interrogative element like Y, clearly occupies a different position because uh, it is uh, higher than uh, the left peripheral focus position, as in examples like two in Italian. Uh, moreover, um, the usual transitivity argument shows that Y occupies a higher position than the position occupied by other WH elements, in that Y can precede a topic as in examples uh, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, four, perché a Gianni gli avete detto questo, which is perfectly natural, whereas other WH elements necessarily uh, follow topics. So this suggests that Y occupies the dedicated position, which is what I've called in previous work, uh, the int uh, position. Topic and uh, the position to which adverbials are proposed are two distinct positions. This is shown in many ways, in particular by the fact that a preposed adverbial has this surprising effect of alleviating a debt trace effect. So take an example like one typical debt trace effect is the man who I think that will sell his house next year, which is deviant in most varieties, in many varieties of English. But then, as John Bresan observed many years ago, if you prepose an adverbial as in two, you get an improved effect. So two is more acceptable with this next year intervening between that and the subject trace. Whereas a similar intervention from an argumental topic like his house does not have an equally beneficial effect. This suggests that the mod position is lower than the topic position uh, at least can be lower than the topic position, in, and as such, it can somehow affect the well-formedness of the subject uh, trace um, at the point of conjunction between the left periphery and the structure of the IP. Here I have suggested a particular analysis of this effect uh, using subject criterion, criterion freezing, certain notions 
conclusions that I developed in the recent work. I will not go into the details of this analysis. Let me just say that according to this analysis, uh, uh, the intervention of, of a preposed adverbial permits a limited recursion of the finiteness head, uh, permitting to a finiteness head uh, from in, in which that is generated, and that, that we further raise to the fourth position at the beginning of the left periphery, and uh, the special fin head that in work like, for instance, my own work with Wurstonsky, has the capacity of licensing subject extraction in a variety of languages. Uh, whereas a topic could not have the same effect because the topic position is too high to have any kind of impact on this kind of property. Okay, so in um, this research, we looked at uh, the acquisition of Hebrew. So we have to see how these properties of the uh, general, uh, the core left peripheral map um, are manifested in uh, Hebrew. And here I rely in part uh, on cartographic work done by Wurschlonsky and on some cartographic research that we did, uh, I mean, uh, Nama, Diana, and I on uh, uh, Hebrew. So the first observation is that the force marker she, corresponding to that in English, is higher than topic. As these examples in six illustrate. Second observation is that the she, which like that can also mark relative clauses, uh, precedes a topic position also in relative clauses. It, it's possible to topicalize a resumptive pronoun as in this kind of example in relative clauses. And the order is uh, that uh, followed by the topicalized resumptive uh, pronoun. So we have a force connected to the relative construction higher than the topic position. And we can show that regular WH elements and Y occupy different positions through the usual transitivity argument. So uh, a regular WH element like who, for instance, me in example eight, necessarily uh, follows the topic in this kind of example, right? Yoni already presented the acquisition paper and the paper about aphasia, who wants to present? That's the only possible order. Whereas uh, lama, why, uh, can, in fact, the most, in the most natural order, does precede the topic. So we have this order. And why the paper about aphasia you don't want to present? So again, by transitivity, using the topic position as the third element to determine the transitivity effect, we arrive at the conclusion that also in Hebrew, why occupies a higher position than regular WH elements. Then the position mod occupies the lower part of the left periphery. So for instance, when we have this suddenly move to the beginning of the clause, um, it's not natural to have it preceding a WH element as in examples like 11. The natural order is WH element followed by this kind of uh, proposed uh, adverbial. So these considerations lead us uh, to a map of the left periphery, like the one that is indicated here. So we have force uh, expressing declarative force uh, in uh, embedded declaratives, for instance, hosting an element like that uh, and hosting the, presumably the relative uh, head, depending on the exact analysis of the relative clause, either the relative head or the relative pronoun. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, the int projection hosting y, and also other things, but y is the relevant element uh, for our discussion today. Then we have our core topic position. Then we have the focus position in the lower part of the periphery, which is used as landing site for WH movement. Then we have the mod position uh, with uh, for proposed adverbials, and then we have finiteness, and then the structure of the IP, which can be as detailed and structured as a Cinque's uh, IP, of course, but we are not looking at the structure of the IP uh, today. So uh, this raises several questions. Uh, is the left periphery accessible to the learner from start to look at the acquisition of that structure? Or if not, 
is it acquired on block as a unit or piece after piece? And if it's piece after piece, uh, does the development respect the hierarchical order or some other principle? And what is the size of the chunks that are acquired in succession, if indeed acquisition takes place in succession? Okay, so we address these questions by uh, looking at uh, spontaneous production. Um, uh, Nama Friedman and her collaborator, Julia Resnick, uh, recorded 56 children, one single recording, long recording per child uh, over a rather large age span from one and a half to six, essentially. Then there were also longitudinal data uh, there was a repetition task, but let, let me just focus on the spontaneous production uh, data for today's presentation. What are the structures that we looked at in the production corpora? Um, first, there are properties that are IP internal, like having the NPVP structure, when the children start having and PVP structures with different types of uh, verb classes, with transitive, with an ergative, with an accusative verbs. And then do we find with an accusative verbs alternations SVVS as we do find in uh, adult Hebrew, okay? So in other words, does the child already recognize the unaccusative character of certain verbs, like come, go, and so on and so forth. Okay, these are properties that are IP internal. And uh, then there are properties that involve the lower part of the left periphery. When does the child start producing WH arguments, WH adjuncts? When does the child start producing adverb preposing? And where do we put yes, no questions? This, this was a real question that we asked, uh, asked. Do yes, no questions go with WH questions? or for instance, with why questions. Uh, and as you see, there is a very clear answer that emerges from the empirical data. Then we looked at properties that concern the upper part of the left periphery, according to our map. Why questions, when do children start producing them? Relatives, uh, topics, topicalization. Uh, and uh, when, do children start producing embedded clauses, embedded declaratives, or embedded indirect questions? Okay, now, so if we look at these uh, 11 properties uh, and, and we just rank children by age, so either the child produces or does not produce a certain type of structure, and this is a ranking by age, so we start with 18 months and then 20, 22, and so on and so forth. So we don't get a very clear pattern. Of course, uh, younger children have more zeros, have fewer configurations than older children, but th there's no very clear effect that we can identify. But then we can try to build uh, a Gutman scale, abstracting away from the actual ages of children. And then we succeed. We manage to build uh, very clear Gatman scales uh, by looking at uh, three sets, the three sets of properties that I mentioned, IP related properties, uh, properties related to the lower part of the left periphery and properties related to the upper part of the left periphery. And here there is a very clear pattern that uh, emerges, uh, um, which is made clear, I think by these red uh, uh, boxes, uh, we have in fact four groups of children, let's say a zero group of children who do not have any of these properties. Presumably they are in the toward stage, they do produce something, but none of the properties that we're looking at. Then we have some children who systematically produce NPVP structures, but nothing concerning their peripheral properties. And then a second group of children who produce IP internal uh, properties and also uh, properties related to the lower part of the left periphery, uh, WH movement, WH with arguments and with adjuncts, but not with Y, adverb movement, and also yes, no question. So 
it is very clear from our data that yes, no questions go with the acquisition of uh, WH questions, not with uh, special questions like why questions or with uh, relatives. And then we have a third group of children who have IP internal properties, properties of the lower part of the left periphery, but also why, why questions, relative clauses, uh, topic constructions, and embedded uh, uh, declarations. So there is a very clear tripartite uh, uh, situation with uh, three different stages uh, in uh, acquisition. Now, various questions are raised at this point. One is, uh, why does a movement appear before a bar movement? Remember, the children who have the uh, VSSB alternation with accusative verbs clearly have a movement. They allow the internal argument to move to subject position. But this shows up in, I mean, this found, this property is found in certain children who do not have any kind of A bar movement. Then, if we look at children who have A bar movement, why do WH questions appear before other types of A bar movement, like relatives, topicalizations, and so on? And why does adverb preposing appear before topicalization, given that in both cases, we are preposing to the left periphery of an argument or of an adverb, but fundamentally it, it, that, that kind of movement will, would look very similar. In fact, it's treated in a similar way by many analysis who assume IP adjunction for both. And then why do relatives, topicalizations, and closal embeddings appear all together? So there's a moment in which these uh, four, uh, uh, th these three constructions uh, appear uh, together. Now, a straightforward answer to these questions is provided by the geometry of the tree. And the hypothesis is that development proceeds bottom up with higher zones that grow on top of lower zones. So at some point, uh, the chunk of the tree in which the landing site of certain types of movement will be expressed. And then all the constructions show up. So at stage one, we have the structure of the AP. We just have uh, uh, DP, uh, VP uh, order, and there's no sign of, uh, no manifestation of the left periphery. We may have DP movement uh, from the object position to the subject position in, uh, with an accusative verbs. There are signs in this phase uh, that the IP, some IP structure is already there because, for instance, agreement uh, is expressed fundamentally correctly. Agreement in number is fundamentally uh, correct, but no manifestation of left peripheral uh, structures. So that's the first uh, little group. Second group, here, the lower part of the left periphery manifests itself. We do have WH questions for subject, object, uh, uh, PP, um, other types uh, of uh, elements, including certain adverbial elements like where, when. Um, we have uh, instances of uh, adverb preposing, for instance, now can get preposed in a number of cases so that the mod layer uh, is there, but there is no manifestation of the upper part of the left periphery. This is only found in uh, the third stage, uh, where this uh, part in uh, pale uh, blue uh, is, uh, is manifested, okay, this uh, higher part. So that we have relative clauses, we have subordinate clauses of various sorts. Notice that subordinate clauses like that clauses require force because uh, they must be selected. So they must contain the node that contains the information that a higher selector wants to have access to, like uh, whether you're dealing with a declarative or with a question or with an exclamative. And that's the kind of information that is expressed by uh, force. Then we have topics in this upper part of the left periphery, as we saw, and we have why questions. We have the int layer, which hosts why. Okay, so stage three is this uh, large group of children. Uh, now, notice that uh, the stage three 
cannot simply be characterized as the stage in which subordination is acquired, uh, because uh, it's true that uh, relatives uh, uh, and uh, embedded declaratives have in common the fact that they are subordinate clauses. So, but we also have here topicalization and why questions, and these are typically found in root environment, and still these are only found in the third stage. And it's not just a matter of presence or absence of a bar movement. We have a bar movement in the second stage with WH movement in declaratives and a bar movement in the third stage with topicalization, relative uh, uh, movement, uh, topicalization, and so on. So the, what, what really provides uh, the, the right ingredient to capture the common properties of stage three is the three geometry again. And the, uh, position in the higher part of the left periphery, which uh, provides the common property of relatives, subordinate declaratives, and also topicalizations and why questions. Okay, so we get this uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, subdivision in groups. So there's the zero group, there's the first uh, group, the first stage, just the structure of the IP, the second uh, uh, group, involved in the second stage with the lower part of the left periphery and then the third group with uh, the lower and the upper zone of the left periphery and notice that uh, here it's very clear that age is not a very good predictor right so for instance uh, we have that uh, the uh, oldest member of the first group uh, was recorded at the age of 26 months and the first member of uh, the second group of the second stage uh, was recorded at 18 months. So that um, different children go through the same sequence of events at very different uh, ages with very different time uh, courses. So we need a device uh, like Gutman's case uh, to allow us uh, to abstract away from age to see the implication of relations between properties. Okay, so let's uh, just look at uh, a few uh, particular points of uh, comparison. Um, dissociation between WH questions and uh, relatives. So we saw that both involve WH movement, but WH questions for arguments and adjuncts are found in the second uh, group, second stage, whereas uh, uh, relatives are only found in the third group. And again, this has to do with the different position, the different landing site of movement in uh, the lower part of the left periphery or questions as indicated by the blue arrow and uh, in the upper part of the left periphery uh, in uh, the case of, of uh, relatives uh, as uh, uh, high as uh, the force uh, uh, position. So this difference immediately follows uh, from the different landing sites of the two types of WH movement in relatives and uh, uh, questions. Then we have that uh, uh, root uh, WH argument questions and adjunct WH questions co-occur in terms of grouping uh, with yes, no questions. And this was an interesting discovery uh, because in principle, you know, everybody agrees that there must be a null operator in uh, name yes, no questions, but this null operator could be uh, in the same position of regular WH elements. So it could be expected to be uh, in uh, uh, stage two, or it could be in a higher position, could be in int, as probably is uh, in uh, embedded, embedded uh, uh, interrogative. So an element like whether, for instance, or if in English, presumably is at the level uh, of int. But in, in, in main clauses, in main yes, no uh, questions, uh, uh, the data we have suggests uh, that uh, the, the position in which the null yes no operator is expressed uh, is in the lower part of the left periphery. So that's an interesting observa empirical observation which would lead to further reflections on the nature and properties of the yes no operator. Then we can observe that relative clauses and embeddings uh, are both found in uh, stage three, because they both require the upper part of the left periphery, as uh, uh, we said, right? Particularly uh, embedded uh, uh, declaratives require force 
in order to satisfy selection requirements from higher selectors so that we have to project the whole structure of the left periphery, at least for finite declaratives. You know, for infinites, the story may be a little bit different, but for finite declaratives, we clearly have to project the, the whole of the left uh, periphery. Okay, uh, then we can compare adverb reposing, uh, which is shown earlier, then topicalization. And again, this correlates with the different height uh, of adverb proposing and uh, topicalization um, with topicalization uh, targeting the upper part of the left periphery and adverb proposing targeting or at least being able to target the lower part of the left periphery. We saw some kind of evidence suggesting that sort of distinction with the adverb effect uh, described by John Bresnan. Then we have that um, uh, regular WH movement of uh, arguments or adjuncts uh, is found earlier in uh, the second stage than why questions, which are only found in the third stage. And this clearly is related to the different position, which was independently, completely independently shown in biographic research, the different height in which regular WH elements are found which is uh, the focus position by and large, at least in main questions, and uh, the position occupied by Y, which is higher up in the int uh, zone. Okay, so I think I'll, I will conclude. We started a little bit late, uh, but I uh, will take maybe another few uh, minutes uh, to conclude, if it is possible. Um, so uh, there are, several remaining issues and questions, which I will just enumerate. Um, the zones, first one has to do with the size of the chunks, right? So the zones which define in an empirically correct way the stages of development have this sort of intermediate size. It's larger than a single X-bar projection. It's not that individual X-bar projections are acquired one after the other. Clearly, that's not what happens. There are chunks that are uh, acquired or that crop up and that show up uh, all together. And clearly, uh, the chunks are smaller than the full CP system because we saw that the lower periphery and the upper periphery uh, are clearly, um, clearly manifest themselves in uh, two different moments in, in that position. So, the important question that arises is what determines the size of the zones? What, what is the principal way to distinguish the size of the zones? And there are various uh, possibilities that come to mind to capture what uh, is empirically uh, observed in uh, the phenomena that we have discussed. One is a refinement of Grimshaw's extended notion of extended projection, and perhaps the most plausible thing to do would be to try to refine phase theory in such a way that each chunk would correspond to a phase. There are all sorts of technical, uh, theoretical, and empirical problems that arise if one tries to pursue this avenue seriously, but that seems to be a very reasonable thing to do. And in general, uh, an important thing to do is to try to reconcile cartographic research and phase theory, and maybe this more general enterprise will have uh, as a consequence, a way for understanding the identification of zones uh, and uh, of uh, stages that uh, um, turn out to be um, correct in uh, acquisition uh, research. Now, what about the stage before state, what we call stage one? Uh, that is to say, this group of children that uh, had uh, zero production of the relevant properties, but still production had started here. Maybe these children are in the one word stage or maybe in the two word stage, if the two word stage is largely, largely consists of uh, VO uh, configurations, for instance. Okay. But this remains to be uh, studied. Um, sorry, I, I had... Uh, uh, I should go back to question two. Is the development of the IP amenable to 
an analogous identification of zones, right? So we have assumed so far that we, we have looked at things in such a way that IEP was considered a single developmental period, but maybe it's not. Maybe there's more to say, and maybe one can identify different stages as was suggested by previous work in the 90s by Andrew Radford, for instance, Harold Clausen, maybe there is some interesting development that takes place within the structure of IP. Take, for instance, the traditional observation that aspect is acquired before tense. Well, this is very telling, of course. I don't know if it is true. This is, has been highly dis disputed, but uh, if it is correct, this would seem to be in, in relation with the fact that uh, the spectral specifications are typically lower than the temporal specification in uh, the tree structure. And then there's the question of how this idea, the growing trees idea, relates to truncation as proposed in work in uh, the 90s and as uh, revived in uh, uh, more recent uh, work. Now, one big difference um, between growing trees and truncation is that uh, truncation is considered to be an option. For instance, uh, uh, you know, root infinitives were analyzed in uh, terms of this truncation process, but clearly the child can switch from a root infinitive to an inflective verbal structure, which suggests that truncation uh, is an option. Uh, in the case of growing trees, we don't seem to have an option, but rather we have the uh, complete absence of a certain chunk of structure. So there's an interesting issue here. Can we relate to these two ideas, uh, truncation and growing trees? I think there are possibilities uh, uh, which I will leave uh, open for the time being. And then what about other major phrases? Uh, for instance, uh, can we identify different stages in the acquisition of DP? And here, the phenomenon that immediately comes to mind is uh, determiner remission. Determiner remission is a very typical uh, phenomenon in uh, child language. So could that be characterized as involving, uh, you know, the growing up of an upper part in the structure of the DP from the nominal part? That remains to be seen. And then, of course, we have only discussed data from one language, Hebrew. What about all the other languages? What about major languages in which a lot of data on acquisition uh, are uh, available? How do things work? Let me just conclude by making a quick reference to one other language, which is Italian. And here I will refer to a joint work uh, with uh, Vincenzo Moscati. This is a research, a corpus research that we started based on childless uh, many years ago in 2014, but then uh, it took a long time to write the paper. At the beginning, this was not at all thought in terms of growing trees. The ideas uh, in question were not uh, available at uh, that time, but uh, as it took a lot, very long time to write this paper, around uh, the end of the writing uh, effort, uh, uh, the growing trees ideas were available. So we tried to see at the very end of the paper to what extent the data observed here were consistent with the growing trees uh, logic. And there is one interesting observation that is shown by this graph, which is the following. Here we have uh, a longitudinal study. So each column is a child. So we have Marco recorded at 20 months, 25, 30, and so on. Then we have Rosa, then we have Diana, and so on, okay? Now, the gray dot represents the first occurrence in these longitudinal studies of WH elements other than Y. Uh, the uh, orange dot represents Y questions. So we have orange dots here, 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 for instance. And the blue dot represents um, uh, subordinate clauses introduced by K the equivalent of that. So as you can see, in all children, the gray dot is the first one uh, to occur. Uh, in other words, WH questions uh, with elements different from Y are the first manifestation of the left periphery in these children as well. 
whereas uh, why questions and that closes often occur in immediate succession, sometimes with the order why questions first and then that closes, sometimes with the order that closes first and then why questions, which means that between why questions and that closes, embedded that closes, we cannot uh, um, uh, write a Gutman scale, right? Because sometimes one comes first and sometimes the other uh, comes first. So that uh, in uh, conclusion, all this is consistent with the view that the lower part of the left periphery with regular WH movement is available earlier than constructions involving the upper part such as Y questions and uh, uh, constructions involving K for that uh, uh, closes. Okay, so let me uh, conclude. Cartographic research now after 25 years has a lot of uh, very well established results, very solid uh, body of uh, empirical uh, data, empirical results, theoretical analysis connected to such results. On the contrary, the study of acquisition and development of cartographic maps is just beginning. In fact, that's the first attempt that we have tried to uh, do here. So in, uh, for, for that kind of trend, we are still at the stage of trying to formulate meaningful questions. We're not at the stage of offering very solid uh, answer, consolidated answers. And clearly, particularly the comparative work is going to be extremely important in the years to come to see if uh, we find uniformity or variation in the successive stages of uh, acquisition. Nevertheless, it seems to me that um, the idea of identifying stages of development corresponding to zones uh, of the tree acquired uh, bottom, bottom up looks uh, promising. Uh, and we can hope that the empirical verification of this kind of uh, hypothesis uh, will lead to revisit all questions in acquisition studies, for instance, revisit all the ideas in the 90s uh, on truncation and on uh, stages in the acquisition of the closed structure, and hopefully also to discover new developmental facts, new generalizations, uh, which may have a significant impact on the study of structural representations and their acquisition. So for the study of cartography and for the theoretical study in uh, general. And I will stop on this uh, note, uh, thanking you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Luigi Rizzi, for this very illuminating talk. I am sure our audience have enjoyed hearing these fresh ideas on cartographic stru structures and the growth of trees and language development. Uh, dear colleagues, since we have a problem with our internet server, we have to immigrate to this new YouTube address. So for some unknown reason, the chat is not working. So please, if you have any question, just send it by email to tescari at unicamp.br. I think that maybe it would appear. Oh, okay, it's now on the, you can view it. So again, tescari at unicamp.br. Uh, let us see, we have uh, some questions already. Okay, Professor Eleni Grola from the University of Sao Paulo sent us the following question. Thank you, Professor Elaini, for being here with us. Uh, so the question is, these observed stages are found in children's productions. So they produce sense that would be comp compatible with the structure they have already acquired, namely that have matured. But how can, how can we explain their comprehensions? their comprehension, sorry. How would they comprehend a question or a sentence containing topicalization if they do not have the corresponding structures yet? Studies with babies, uh, 18 month old infants, indicate that they comprehend WH questions from an 
early age leads and Perkins 2021. Uh, we have received another, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so that's the question uh, from Professor Eleni Grola and Professor Rizzi, please. Yes, yes, okay. This is of course a very important question. Uh, and it's clear that uh, there is a lot of evidence, uh, anecdotal evidence and also controlled experimental evidence uh, which suggests that in certain domains, uh, um, comprehension is more advanced than production, right? Uh, now, uh, what kind of conclusion can we draw from that? Uh, um, I think there is an important kind of work that should be done to test specifically this hypothesis because we should test children exactly on the kinds of structures that they do not manifest in production, right? So we should do a very systematic uh, comparison between uh, production and comprehension in the same group of children. And this has not been done. So we don't know. Well, unfortunately, we cannot say what the answer would be uh, at this point. Suppose it turns out uh, that, um, you know, comprehension of certain configurations like WH configuration turn, turn out uh, uh, to uh, be apparently more advanced, uh, but without really manifesting a structural knowledge. So it's simply because the child uh, has a number of strategies that uh, allow him or her to figure out that something is a question and then figure out the nature of the WH element and then respond correctly. So it could be it's a matter of strategies, but we don't know. Again, the only way to really meaningfully address this question would be to do to simultaneously work on uh, comprehension and production on exactly the same types of structures and with exactly the same group of uh, children. And for the moment, uh, uh, we have not uh, done that. So we. I, we cannot, well, we can speculate uh, of what we could say if it turns out that there is no asymmetry. If there's no asymmetry, actually, there's very little to speculate. That's exactly what is expected. If there is an asymmetry, then the question is why um, the uh, comprehension system seems to be more advanced than the production system in a way that is grammatically significant, that, that can be grammatically expressed in terms of kind of graphic structures. That's a very interesting question. And I don't know what the answer would be, but I would prefer not to speculate on that without having clear data suggesting uh, if there is or if there is no asymmetry between production and comprehension. In any event, that's a very important uh, question. And I hope in uh, a couple of years we'll be able also to have at least some elements of empirical evidence uh, uh, bearing on that. Thank you very much, Professor Rizzi. Uh, now we have received another question by Virginia Vallian from Hunter College and CUNY Graduate Center. She's asking the following, what implications does this analysis have for children's development of and understanding about the type and distribution of subjects in their languages. Right. Uh, um, well, okay. So the, uh, the type and distribution of subjects, um, we, we should first consider that the distribution of subjects varies cross-linguistically to some extent but not enormously, right? We typically have, we take the major uh, word order types, uh, SVO, SOV, VSO. The generalization clearly is that the subject precedes and is higher than the object, right? What varies is the position of the verb between uh, or at the very end or at the very beginning or at the very end, but the subject object asymmetry is uh, systematically uh, kept, uh, which means that there is something general about uh, the status of uh, uh, subjects. 
and that is acquired. Uh, it's not surprising to observe that this is found early in uh, uh, children. The interesting question that arises would be again on uh, data that we do not have, at least not in this particular research, even though there is a lot of data on that. So I don't know if Virginia uh, had in mind uh, uh, the uh, well-known issue of uh, early subject drop, uh, which uh, uh, she studied and that a number of people uh, studied also in the acquisition of uh, non-null subject languages like uh, English, uh, French, and so on and so forth. So here, the interesting issue that arises is, uh, is there anything like uh, a pure subjectless uh, uh, phase uh, followed by a phase with, with a subject. So a period in which subject to issue is completely systematic or not. It's not entirely clear from, from the empirical evidence, um, but uh, uh, if one tries to extend the growing tree's logic to the IEP structure, one may expect that children start with uh, the lower structural configuration and then they add uh, upper layers uh, a little bit uh, in the way uh, in which uh, uh, Andrew Radford assumed the acquisition of the IP structure to be in uh, uh, the early uh, 1990s. So it, it would be an, an extremely interesting and important thing to do to start to, to extend this logic to the IP configuration. So for the data that we looked at, uh, uh, we just assumed that the IP structure is there and characterizes the initial stage of the development that we looked at. But this is simply because we didn't look at IP internal distinctions, right? So if one does that, and of course, doing that through a corpus study requires a very rich corpus in the relevant very young age range, then maybe one discovers uh, interesting things. But uh, again, it's not something that uh, uh, we have done in this research, at least. Uh, thank you, Professor Rizzi. Uh, Virginia replied that she actually, she's actually, she, she's actually thinking more about no pronominal and lexical subjects. Right, so there are these three variants. There are no subjects, of course, uh, there are pronominal subjects uh, and there are lexical subjects. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, again, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's hard to speculate. Well, I have a lot of work on this topic, but uh, not related and not thought in terms of the growing trees logic. So it would be important to see if the growing trees logic have something, has something to say on subject distribution and the typology of subjects that uh, Virginia mentioned. But for the moment, I cannot uh, say anything more uh, on that, even though the topic is, of course, fascinating and extremely important. Thank you, Ritzi. Um, Professor Ana Maria Brito has sent her congratulations on this magnificent conference and greetings from Porto, Portugal. Thank you, thank you. And there arrived a question from Selene Rodriguez from Puc Rio. Uh, in a typical aging, Alzheimer's disease, for example, language losses seem to happen in the opposite order of language acquisition. What is acquired later is lost earlier. Oops, sorry. What is acquired later is lost earlier. Yes, okay. That's uh, is it the case that Alzheimer's patients present problems with why questions and sentences embedding earlier than problems with regular WH movement and argument structure? Uh, thank you, uh, Selene, for this uh, uh, very interesting question. Of course, uh, what, what you are uh, expressing uh, is uh, uh, 
very important hypothesis expressed by the famous linguist Roman Jakobson many, many years ago, uh, which uh, in essence, language loss is the mirror image of language acquisition, right? And that is an hypothesis that um, if taken literally, doesn't seem to be correct in general, but it may well be correct in specific cases. Uh, so it may well be that uh, the gradient of uh, complexity that uh, determines uh, the succession of steps in acquisition is somehow, somehow also expresses the succession of steps in uh, uh, language loss. Uh, and so it would be extremely interesting, for instance, to test the uh, Alzheimer patients that you mentioned, but also, uh, you know, other types of um, um, language loss, like uh, aphasia, for instance. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, a version um, uh, of uh, the truncation idea was introduced many years ago uh, in the context of aphasia studies uh, by Nana Friedman and uh, Yossi Gorzinski, uh, what they call the tree pruning hypothesis, suggesting that uh, um, the um, you know, agromatic patients would have problems with the CP layer. Now, they were working with pre-cartographic structures. If you add uh, cartography, uh, then the whole picture becomes richer uh, because there are many more possible sites uh, um, at, at which things may change either in acquisition or in uh, language loss. So a very natural question to ask would be if in some pathological populations, we observe the mirror image of the phenomena that we observe. For instance, uh, that let's say topicalizations uh, are harder or impossible, whereas WH questions, normal WH questions are still possible, and why questions are harder or impossible when other types of WH questions are possible. Of course, I don't know the data, I have no idea of uh, whether things are like that, so, but that would be a very interesting thing uh, to test in this kind of population. And uh, then if successful, um, this kind of testing would show that there is an element of truth in uh, Roman Jakobson's uh, uh, traditional approach to, to this phenomenon, which may well be the case. Thank you, Professor Rizzi. Uh, just let me check if there, there are um, any more. Oh, OK. So let's uh, just see if, is, the, is there someone in this room who would like to make a, a question to Professor Luigi Rizzi? Oh yes, can I start? Of yeah. course, please. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for your inter interesting talk, Professor Rizzi. I am Raquel, uh, an MA student from Incampi, a member of La Casa. And my question is about some different interpretation regarding the WH element Y and language acquisition. Uh, some research suggests that it may present two readings, the purpose and the, reading, the reason why. So regarding the first one, namely the purpose reading, it is analyzed at this by Psy 2008 as being merged in a lower position somewhere above the little VP. So uh, my question is, is there uh, some asymmetry observed in the acquisition of Y regarding its interpretation um, in purpose or reason? Or even is there uh, an, asymmetry, an asymmetry regarding Y and other purpose like adverbs, like what for, for example? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, again, uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, we did not observe that. So we did not uh, uh, observe uh, a systematic difference between purpose uh, why and reason why, but we did not observe that because we did not look for that distinction, right? So uh, again, it, it would be important, absolutely important. I mean, uh, you're absolutely right that that distinction is very relevant. Uh, Dylan Tsai uh, has uh, clear evidence from Mandarin Chinese and other languages uh, suggesting that distinction. 
uh, and the the distinction is clearly shown also you know in, in different ways in a variety of languages take for instance french which is a wh in c2 language right uh, so pourquoi cannot be found in c2 so you can say il est parti pourquoi he left why uh, whereas you can say il est parti comment he left how that's perfectly fine okay but again, there is some hesitation between speakers, but for some speakers, uh, if you write pourquoi as two words, pourquoi, which selects uh, the purpose reading, then it becomes at least marginally possible to have it in situ, which suggests that, uh, in fact, um, you know, purpose why starts exactly as you said, and uh, Dylan said, starts from a lower position. So uh, this would suggest an independent research completely targeted uh, at studying. This could be done experimentally also, right? It would be possible to do because one of the problems with uh, uh, corpus studies uh, is that uh, you have very little control. And if you want, for instance, to determine whether in a certain structure there's a purpose interpretation or the reason interpretation, you have to look at the context. It's not, sometimes it's quite uh, complicated to do so. But you, you can, you know, typically the, the way to proceed is to start with a corpus study, get the gross, the grand picture, and then do specific targeted experiments uh, uh, looking at specific points, right? So that is something that uh, could be done, either elicitation experiments uh, or in the context that was raised by a number of previous questions, if comprehension turns out to be to, to work essentially the same way, then through comprehension experiments, which are always easier than elicitation experiments. So this is again very reasonable and very interesting work uh, to do. And um, so the, the purpose of this research is to generate uh, the opportunity for uh, other kinds of uh, research developments in different uh, directions, corpus studies, exper experimental work, and so on and so forth. So I very much hope that uh, maybe two, three, four years from now, we'll have uh, data on the questions on which, uh, unfortunately, I cannot say anything uh, definite uh, at this point. In any event, thank you very much. Very interesting question. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Rizzi. Uh, any other question from our room? I have okay. one. Uh, oh, when I start, oh. Yeah. Oh, you can ask. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so, ah, okay, so okay. You okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Achilles, sorry. No Hello, everyone. Thank you, Professor Luigi, uh, for this excellent talk. Uh, my question is uh, a curiosity about the structure acquisition, uh, because uh, some sentences have uh, prepositional phrases in preverbal positions, and these are no topicalized in Brazilian Portuguese. We also see dates in preverbal positions. In such cases, the constituents would be in subject P. For example, we know that this appears to be a position with mixed properties, argumental and discursive. If one thinks about language, acquisition, uh, where or, or when exactly would this position emerge? Would it come out between stages two and three, perhaps? Right, okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sandra, for this very interesting question. In fact, uh, um, one could phrase uh, the question, which is very close to, or maybe identical to what you said, uh, 
uh, in languages that have so-called quirky subjects, quirky subjects, that is to say subjects which do not have the nominative case, let's say. Icelandic is the typical case, but you also find it in languages like um, the Romance languages. Uh, and, uh, well, in uh, Brazilian Portuguese, there are some special properties, uh, uh, but in any event, there is this clear notion of quirky subject. Now, quirky subjects uh, are subjects, involve subject positions. So the expectation, all other things being equal, would be that quirky subjects uh, could appear in principle in uh, uh, the phase in which the IP is there, right? Um, now, of course, before putting too much uh, emphasis on this kind of prediction, we should keep in mind that quirky subjects are possible only, I, I don't know if this is exactly the class of verbs that you have in mind, but uh, in um, other uh, languages with quirky subjects, they are typically possible only with certain types of predicates, certain types of verbs, like uh, psychological verbs, for instance, like uh, uh, piacere, for instance, in Italian, a Gianni piace la musica, that, that kind of configuration. Similarly in Icelandic, similarly in uh, other Germanic languages. And so it could be uh, that uh, there are some inherent difficulties uh, with these particular verb classes that are classes of psychological state and uh, that sort of thing. But structurally speaking, the prediction is clear. Quirky subjects should be available already at when the IEP structure is present. So that, uh, that, that, that's very clear. And it will be worth testing, absolutely. Then the other part of your question uh, concerns uh, the status of proposed PPs, which uh, is somewhat uh, unclear between two things, um, uh, topicalization, argument topicalization, and adverb preposing, right? There are some cases uh, in which you prepose a PP in which it's not entirely clear whether it targets a topic position or a mod-like position. Uh, for instance, if you try the alleviating effect of that trace effects, in English, uh, there's a gradient. Certain types of PPs uh, have the alleviating effect, suggesting that the PP goes to a mod like position. And in other cases, no, you don't see any such effect. So there is an element of complexity uh, there. PP proposing could well be a partly different animal from both straight argument of organization and straight adverb proposing. So again, there are very interesting lines uh, to pursue, both in language description and uh, uh, in uh, the study of language acquisition. When do we find these phenomena? Thank you. Okay, shall I ask? Okay. okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Rich, again, and now Professor Achilles, please. <laughs> Thank you very much for this thought-provoking talk, Professor Rizzi. In your joint work with uh, Friedman and Belet, which has been recently published by Glossa, and you've mentioned in the presentation, the interesting findings on language acquisition by Hebrew children have shown that they first, ma they first mastered a movement and the S, V, O order in simple structures, then A, ba movement to CP, structures involving relativization strategies, topicalization, and finally, I to C. Well, cartographic research on the IP domain, mainly the work inspired by Guglielmo Cinque, has shown that we would have a detailed functional sequence of almost 30 to 40 categories, which are, uh, as you know, rigidly ordered, an order which is the same cross-linguistically. There are ways to realize those projections either by external modes, 
or by movement or even agree as your 20 and 17 walk on the format and uh, locus of parameters issued by linguistic analysis has shown. Now, thinking on the inflectional romance type languages, what are the growing three approach predictions for the acquisition of verbal morphology? Since in romance, for instance, the tense aspect and mood categories are realized all together in the verbal morphology, should the morphology of the 10 categories be only mastered when the growing process arrives at the upper part of the IP, say, to mood and modal higher categories? And another uh, closely related question, should we expect that the mastering of categories from the inflectional domain in the head format and in the phrasal format, I mean, the material in the specifier generally uh, merged in specifier positions would happen side by side? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Achilles. These are very important questions. Again, um, you know, the um, probably the, the best way to address the acquisition of Cinque structure would be uh, to look at uh, agglutinative languages, right? Because uh, in agglutinative structures, you see all these little morphemes separate morphemes that are fused in our Indo-European inflections in, in a way that, uh, in spite of uh, you know, Humboldt's uh, idea that uh, inflection, inflectional languages are the, the most perfect ones, uh, uh, from the viewpoint of a cartographer, I'm afraid we do not necessarily agree with Humboldt, right? <laughs> because uh, in a sense, uh, uh, you know, agglutinative languages represent an ideal uh, configuration, at least in terms of transparency, because you re we really see things very, very straightforwardly. Um, so I think one natural way to address your question would be to take uh, uh, some extreme case of agglutinative language and see if we find an ordering in the acquisition of uh, the uh, little uh, pieces that in the end get attached uh, to the verb. And that could offer us evidence to make predictions about the acquisition of, uh, let's say, French or Spanish or, or Italian, in which these informations get fused together in, in certain inflections. Now, if we start from, from inflections, we do not necessarily immediately have completely reliable answers because it could be, for instance, that uh, the child's initial assumptions on the meaning of a particular inflectional element is not completely adult-like, right? It could be that, uh, you know, uh, that, 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 uh, if a certain piece of inflection expresses both, uh, let's say, mood, uh, um, subject agreement, uh, tense, and aspect, the child may be using it just to express aspect, for instance. It could be. It is imaginable that uh, we would find that, that sort of situation. That is why probably the, the simplest and best way to address this kind of question would be to start with uh, agglutinative or agglutinating languages. Uh, having said that, the question you're asking essentially is uh, what I mentioned very briefly on the possibility of extending the growing trees approach to the IEP structure. It's clear that if we do that, uh, we should not just uh, assume an IP small v, uh, VP structure, but we should assume a Cinquean representation in its full glory or 
the kind of representations that you have in your work in their full glory and see what we can determine about them. Clearly, the advantage between earlier attempts uh, like Radford uh, or like uh, Harold Klassen, for instance, who addressed exactly these questions in the 90s, is that we now have these cartographic representations that can guide us to have certain expectations. So again, this is very important work that uh, I'm sure will start in uh, the immediate future, or at least I very much hope that it will. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much, Professor Luigi Rizzi. And it seems like we have received questions uh, from Lena Pozo, Firenze, and Lynn Elbank from New Mexico. But we no longer have enough time to read them, so we are sorry. But we will be forwarding the emails to Professor Rizzi yeah. directly, as well as Lena's last message. So uh, thank you, Professor Rizzi. And well, we are almost out of time. So dear Professor Luigi Rizzi and dear colleagues and audience, here in Brazil, it's time to have lunch and it's also probably time to have dinner in Paris or at least to drink a spritz. So, ching ching. That's aperitif time. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Professor Sandra Corazemi and Professor Achilles Tescarineto, please, uh, would you like to say something to our audience at this time so we can wrap up? Uh, but before that, one more time, I would like to say that I feel very honored and thankful for the opportunity to mediate this magnificent conference. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Sandra and Professor Achilles, please. Ladies okay. first, Sandra. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Achilles. I would like to thank Professor Luigi Rizzi for presenting to us with this brilliant conference. It is an honor to complete the 2021 editions of Zoom na Cartografia with the participation of Rizzi who is the precursor of the cartographic enterprise together with the professor Guglielmo Cinque. I would, la, I would also like to especially thank all the professors who accepted our invitation to participate of uh, Zoom na Cartografia in this very, really complicated year. Thank you so much, Guglielmo Cinque, Giuseppe Samo, Caterina Bonan, Christopher Lensliger, Cecilia Poleto. And now I would also, also like to thank my colleague Achilles for taking on this project with me, which is a project that opens up space for the discussion of cartographic studies. Thank you, Achilles, for this partnership. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you, Professor Rizzi, for this conference, which gifted the audience with what synthetic theory, in this case, Syntactic cartography can do at its best, not only on poorly theoretical grounds, but also on more, on more applied fields, as is the case of language acquisition. Well, dear colleagues, this is our last Una Cartografia this year, and it has been a great pleasure for the Cartographic Syntax Laboratory Research and Teaching La Casa at the University of Campinas, together with the Center for Grammatical Studies, NEG, at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, to brought to a larger audience this series of colloquia on syntactic cartography. We will continue this important project next year, but following the South American academic year, we are going to start the 2022 series of conference on March. 
I would like to thank Professor Sandra Parezemin, a leading cartographer here in Brazil, for the partnership in the conduction of this important project. Today, synthetic cartography is spread all over the world world, and particularly here in Brazil, it has found a fertile field among Brazilian scholars and also students. We, I would like to thank our Zuma Cartografia team, Vitor Hoxprung, Isabella Flood, Joy Matos, who helped us in the first colloquia, John Bergamini Perez, and all the students from our labs who are enrolled in our postgraduate programs in linguistics at Unicamp and Uf UFSC, who helped us as moderators in the six colloquia we had this year. This year, we've got the pleasure of hearing conference by cartographers from different countries, as Sandra has already said. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you all for the audience and support, and long life to synthetic cartography. <laughs> thank you.